you know, and I do look at every day as, in a way, as starting from a clean slate. And that if something hasn't just literally gone extinct, well, then there's something you can do about it. Right? This episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Tidal Influence, a Californian ecological consulting firm who proudly supports environmental education and all of the diverse conservation efforts that Pelicanus works to highlight. Visit their website at tidalinfluence.com to learn more about what they do to conserve our coastal resources and how you can get involved. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pelicanus. Pelicanus is a nonprofit organization focused on sharing the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. Now, this is Conservation Conversations, our long form documentary style show that highlights the people and organizations that are making it their purpose to grow the conservation field and to show that people have and still are making monumental differences in our world with intentional change. Head over to pelicanus.org to find all of our episodes and more. In this episode, we talked to Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the Thomas Lovejoy. Now, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy is one of the most influential people in the U.S. when it comes to the environment. He has worked at the World Wildlife Foundation, the Smithsonian Institute. He has advised multiple presidential administrations, the United Nations, along with so much more. He is known as the godfather of biodiversity and has spent decades working to protect the biodiversity of the Amazon rainforest, among many other accomplishments. We were so lucky to talk with him, and he was just awesome, telling us story after story from his lifetime of scientific adventure that we can draw so much inspiration from. Now let's join our conversation with him now. I think that's one thing that we like to uh, reiterate to people is, you know, I've talked to, you know, more field biologist type people, and they say, well, I'm working on you know, desert tortoises or whatever it is. And there's not really a whole lot of good news in my park, but it's like, the good news is that you're there. The good, good news is that the government or nonprofits have put the effort forth to save these species. I mean, most of us who, who work in this field actually are fundamentally optimists. Otherwise, we wouldn't try to do things, right? My approach is just to look at the start of every day as a completely fresh slate as to what might be possible. Because media tend to focus on bad news, uh, the good news often doesn't get much attention. And uh, so my, my favorite example of this is when I first set foot in the Amazon in 1965, there was one national park that happened to be in Venezuela. And the Amazon is like 48 the 48 contiguous U.S. states. It's huge, right? Wow. And at that point, it was 97% intact. Uh, so a lot of bad things have happened in the Amazon. You will have heard a whole bunch of them. Uh, but the story that rarely gets told is how close to 50% of the Amazon is formally protected as conservation areas or as demarcated indigenous reserves. And they aren't perfection, but we're talking about, you know, 50% of something like the 48 contiguous US states. You know, those, those countries should get credit for it. Now, yes, they should be taking care of them better, uh, but they also, you know, need some recognition for that. Uh, Dr. Lovejoy, going through your- You can call me Tom. Right. Okay. <laughs> With all respect, I'm, I'm going to find it very difficult to call you Tom, Dr. Lovejoy, but I'll call you Tom as best I can. <laughs> um, so looking through uh, you know, the, the list of your experiences and the, the decades of work that you've done and the, all the awards that you've won, I could sit here and, and list them all out, but then we'd run out of time. So if you don't mind, everybody, would you? Everybody would fall asleep. <laughs> is this, would you mind uh, introducing yourself so, so I'm Tom Lovejoy, and uh, when I was 14, my father thought I should go away to school, get out from under. And uh, by good fortune, the first school I looked at had a zoo called the Millbrook School. And 
and I liked animals. So I said, this is where I want to go. I don't want to look anywhere else. And luckily I got in. I had no idea about science. Uh, before I even arrived, I learned I was going to have to take biology in the first or second year. And I literally said, I'll take it the first year and get it over with. And the biology teacher uh, who had also started the zoo uh, was just a charismatic whirlwind of a guy who basically changed my life in three weeks. And he marched me through the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom and all other kinds of biology were hung on in between. So before I was 15, I understood the outline of life on Earth, as then known. And, you know, today we would call that biological diversity. And I was just totally fascinated with that. And I've never been able to get enough of it since. Although all my mentors, including that biology teacher, put an emphasis on conservation as one of them said, any biologist with a conscience should spend time on conservation. That, that wasn't particularly central to my life. I wanted to have a life of scientific adventures. You know, I was planning to do a PhD on montane forest birds in East Africa. I was, I was besotted with East Africa and all those animal cracker animals that walk around, right? Uh, and, and then my former freshman advisor happened to uh, say to me that he thought if I wrote to somebody at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, I could probably get the support to spend the better part of essentially my first summer in graduate school uh, in the Amazon with him. And I never looked back. I mean, it was like, it's, it's like you woke up and it's Christmas morning and you're in the beginning of the longest biological diversity stocking in the world. And, you know, it's more than a lifetime of things to do in the Amazon. And I was, you know, I continued to be concerned about conservation. The Brazilians had planned a big highway system in the Amazon, and I literally wrote an article about it in 1972, I think, called it the Trans-Amazonica colon highway to extinction question mark. And then in about October of 1973, I ended up taking a job as employee number 13 in a tiny little organization in Washington, D.C. called the World Wildlife Fund United States. That was just when everything was taking off about the environment. So it was a very, very exciting time. And I thought I'd, you know, I thought I'd go and do that for two years and then I'd go back on the science adventure track. But I began to realize how intrinsically interesting conservation was. I began to apply my science to it. I began to see how amazingly important it was. The, the forces of destruction were growing all the time. So I ended up staying there 14 years. That was pretty transformational. You know, I basically helped two or three others found the science of conservation biology. And after the 14 years, I went to the Smithsonian to be an assistant secretary for external affairs. I ended up meeting Tim Worth, a young senator from Colorado, probably a week or two before he held the hearings where Jim Hansen announced that climate change was happening. And in the middle of that summer, the first satellite images of deforestation in the Amazon became available, and they were much worse than even the gloomiest of us thought it actually was. And Tim said to me, well, we, meaning the Congress, 
uh, should do a trip to Brazil and see if there are things we can do to help. Uh, you know, a week after I met Tim, he had me to lunch up in the Senate dining room. And my life on the interface of science and public policy probably can be best dated from that moment. The trip to Brazil was amazing. It was, it was Tim, it was John Hines, it was Al Gore. Uh, it was Ben Bradley, the executive editor of the Washington Post, famous, you know, for covering Watergate and all that stuff. And like two weeks before we were scheduled to leave, Chico Mendes, the head of the Rubber Tappers, was assassinated, which totally changed the way our trip to Brazil was seen in Brazil. Happily, because I'd had experience in Brazil and because Tim Worth valued that, we basically pulled off that trip without becoming disrespectful. We actually had a meeting in, uh, in Porto Velho uh, and the background music in the hotel, get this, was smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, but it's a detail you can't forget, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes you do things in life that you don't realize you've done. Uh, and sometimes you learn about them much, much later. So about six or seven years ago, I lose track now. The Brazilian who had been leading the foreign ministry uh, during our trip, who had become a personal friend, uh, said to me, said, you know, when you and Tim came, meaning that trip, that's when I decided Brazil should invite the Earth Summit to be in Rio. You know, I would have never known, right? So I've had some pretty interesting times. You know, the, the state of the world biologically today is, is obviously much worse than when I started, um, which doesn't mean that good things haven't happened like we were talking about earlier. The challenge of climate change is really pretty terrible, but there, there is a solution to it. So part of what I did when I was at the World Wildlife Fund was fairly frequently, I would lift my eyes up from the trenches and think about, you know, are there other problems on the horizon that we should be anticipating? Uh, and in 1987, a colleague and I organized the first scientific meeting on climate change and biological diversity. And that became one of the things I've specialized on ever since. So like 30 odd years and three books. And in that 30 years at the beginning, Basically, all you could do is look at what happened in the geologic past and project that into the future. By the time the second book came out, which was 2005, uh, you could see the fingerprints of climate change almost anywhere you looked in nature on the planet. And by the time the third came out in 2019, you could begin to see just major gross changes taking place. The whole climate change negotiations, uh, you know, around the climate change convention has, has been mostly looked at through physical science eyes, not with much biological sensitivity. And I think basically we now know that biological systems are incredibly sensitive and that at more than a hundred more than one and a half degrees, the planet becomes biologically unmanageable. So evidence. We know geolo in geologic time that with major climate change that ecosystems actually come apart. 
and the individual species move in their own particular directions and speeds and then they then the survivors assemble into ecosystems which it is simply hard to predict in advance we're already seeing some of that happen so that has led me to conclude that more than one and a half degrees is actually a place that it would be really bad to go to and so what do we do about all of that especially given the fact that our co2 in the atmosphere is so way far beyond what we'd end up at one and a half degrees with uh that it looks like it's all over uh just you know there's a lag time and that's one of the big advantages here you can do something if there's a lag time so about two years ago a new estimate came out about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere from mostly destruction of forests and it was it came out with with some amazing numbers uh, but so far, nobody other than me is saying that the amount of carbon in the atmosphere from destroyed terrestrial nature is about equal to what remains in existing terrestrial nature. In other words, we've destroyed half of it and then put it up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's bad news, but it's also good news in the sense that reforestation and ecosystem restoration uh, can bring some of that back. And if you bring back one third of that amount, uh, you could actually get back to a CO2 level of 350 parts per million, which would give you the soft landing that we need. And I find there are two big pluses to that. Uh, one is that to the extent that people begin to understand this, they'll begin to realize the importance of nature and, yeah, and further that planet actually works as a linked physical and biological system. In fact, climate change is entirely biological because fossil fuels are just ancient ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. And the other great thing about it is that suddenly individuals are in a position to make a difference. It's no longer some great monster thing. What can I possibly do? So go down to the nearest bar, you know, and never reemerge, right? Uh, because everybody can help plant a tree or help restore a wetland, you know, or restore some degraded uh, agricultural land or grazing land. And something that even kids can do. So it's empowering. Your love of the Amazon, your decades of work in the Amazon, the, the, one of the first things I read about you was the, I believe it was your dissertation uh, introduced the, the method of uh, bird banding to the Amazon. And as someone who banded birds in the Amazon two summers ago as part of my master's program, thank you, one. Uh, and two, uh, I, I can't, we kind of just want to get more of a, a, a feel of your uh, experience and I guess why you went to the Amazon, what, because uh, you kind okay. of already mentioned why you went there, but why, why did you keep coming back? And can you give us some specific examples of success stories of working with local Amazonian people? So um, as both of you will know and have experienced, you can't spend time in a bit of nature without beginning to actually relate to it. So here I was, I, you know, I just was this, you know, geeky scientist who wanted to, you know, have scientific adventures and what better place to do it than the greatest single repository of biodiversity on earth, right? You know, it's one of those things that there's always something new and interesting every, anytime you go into the forest and you, you can't predict it either. Uh, I have this favorite camp called Camp 41, uh, which is 41 kilometers from the highway. 
from Manaus to, to Venezuela, and it's part of the research camps for the Forest Fragments Project. And that was set up as a, a real experiment, right? So that we would actually study the parts of the forest that then became fragments. So we knew what they were like before they were isolated. Uh, but we also, you know, in good scientific fashion, we had matching plots in intact forest so that we could be able to distinguish between changes that were occurring because of fragmentation and isolation and those that were just changing generally across the forest. Uh, so Camp 41 is one of those forest interior plots. And it's, pr it's pretty fabulous because it's, it is forest primeval. And it's unbroken forest from there all the way to the Guianas. You probably won't see the jaguar. I've never seen the jaguar. Uh, they've been seen a few times, but they see us. We see their footprints, right? But that'll give you a sense of just how incredibly wild it is. Uh, and there's always, always some really amazing thing that you see. And uh, so a couple of years ago, I was taking a bunch of people in for a visit. And when I, when I do that, I always boogie down the trail and try to get to camp before everybody else so I can welcome them. I have a very goofy way of doing it, you know, saying, you know, Taylor Parker, I presume. Right. <laughs> uh, but in any case, so I'm boogieing down the trail and I see something flopping out of my right eye a little bit. And I think, oh, it's a morpho butterfly. And those are pretty spectacular. You know, they're iridescent blue butterflies, big. And, uh, but I took a few more steps and it sank in. Now that's not flying like a morpho flies. It's much more floppy. So I looked and that was true. And it's also very pale. So I followed it uh, until it landed on a tree trunk. Didn't have the presence of mind to actually photograph it uh, with my cell phone. And it was what is known as the white witch. The white witch is the largest moth in South America. And it is so rare and poorly known that nobody knows what its caterpillar looks like. So how could you not love going into a forest where you have those kinds of things happen, right? At least for somebody like me. But also, I mean, because I was working at the World Wildlife Fund, I began to be acutely aware of all the different things we're doing to the natural world and how incredibly important that conservation is. And so I, I sort of looked at it through two lenses uh, simultaneously. One was a scientific lens, uh, and the other was through, you know, what can you do about it? One of, well, probably one of the more important things I ever did, I know that it doesn't show up very much in things written about me, but in like 1980 or 81, something like that, I got it in my head that we weren't going to make a lot of progress until there was more on nat about nature on television. By the 1982 season, we had the first year of what is now the Nature Series, which I will in fact watch tonight because they have a little show on Madagascar. I want to see what it's like. So that's probably one of the more important things I've ever done. And yeah, it's fun to have an Emmy on my wall in my university office. Uh, it was just, you know, trying to figure out ways to make more of a difference, right? Okay. And the other, and the other, there are a couple other parts about it. One is, one is, uh, it's very rewarding to help young people early in their careers. So that's a a big piece about it. Uh, Another was sort of learning to talk about it without becoming sort of a bore. 
uh, and to always put an emphasis on solutions. And I very quickly learned, you know, when I was going to a country, no matter how deep my knowledge was of what might be useful, uh, just to start by saying, well, how can I help? And so as a consequence, you know, there are dozens and hundreds of us around the world who sort of operate that way. And yeah, there's rivalry between different organizations. And that's, that's basically a natural social primate kind of thing. Uh, but when I went to the Smithsonian, I was not seen as a competitor because the Smithsonian was so big, right? So I have very carefully tried to maintain that sense of neutrality ever since. There are times when I would have liked to have had an office downtown and it would have been the easiest thing in the world to ask WWF, uh, but I didn't want to get the label. I love WWF, but I didn't want, want the label. That's why I'm sometimes known as the Switzerland of conservation. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I just made it up as I went. <laughs> you know, talking about being the Switzerland and kind of being um, able to talk to both sides, it, that's, that's something I'm, I'm really uh, fascinated by with your career, with the, your ability to go from essentially a field biologist working in the Amazon to then advising uh, multiple presidential administrations. Uh, you worked for the World Bank for a while. Um, I, as someone who is more, way, way more on the, the, the field biologist side, how do you then translate that to the larger organizations like presidential administrations or the World Bank? What strategies do you employ when you talk to them about the value and saving biodiversity? Well, you know, it, it Interesting. I mean, there, there's some, it doesn't work with everybody, right? But there certainly are always some people who, for one reason or other, have enjoyed nature or are open to having an experience. So I've had 21 U.S. senators go to Camp 41. And yes, they are, they're somewhat pre-selected in doing that. But I've actually found over time that the best way to actually sell them is not to do a lot of lecturing and talking, but to let the forest do the big sales job. And I, I do ensure that at the end of three days of listening to biodiversity day and night, that they actually have internalized that we are on a living planet and that's transformational, right? They just think differently as a consequence. You know, and I'm sure, you know, Austin, you've had experiences where you've shown people butterflies or whatever it is, and like suddenly they look at them for the first time as, as if they'd never seen them before, right? I've had more of those experiences with uh, plants. Uh, one of the people we talked to a few years ago is a botanist with the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. And she talked about when she was going through school, she had this green blur where she just walked down a trail and it was all just green. And then when she started learning plants, the world just like opened up to her. It was like she was colorblind and now she can see color. And I feel I've had a very small, <laughs> much smaller experiences with people with that. When you start to say, hey, that's this plant and this is this plant. And then that bird uses this plant. It starts to click where like, oh, this is like, you, you know, you hear about ecosystems, but once they start to connect, it is, you can, like, as you said, it's transformational. Well, you know, I mean, when you first go and in, into the Amazon forest, uh, it's sort of overwhelming monotony because you haven't developed that ability to see the difference yet. And I, I remember my first day, I was like, well, what's the big deal? <laughs> it's all, it's really green. Uh, but then eventually, you know, you, you begin to see unbelievable numbers of shades of green that you've never seen before. Uh, I mean, I, I joke about writing a book called 50 Shades of Green. Right? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I take people up the, 
the canopy tower on the way to visiting Camp 41. And I tell them they've never seen so many shades of green before in their life. And pretty quickly they get it. Uh, it's, it's no longer sameness and monotony. It's just this incredible diversity. Right? Kind of in the same, same vein, but on a, a bigger scale, you developed the, the debt for nature swap idea. Conservation issues are often considered humans versus nature. Whether or not that is the case and ever existed, in some ways that's the way some people look at it. And this idea is a little bit of a blurring of that. What was the inspiration for creating that? So, so you know, I guess part of it is I'm always looking for solutions. In fact, that's the single course I teach at George Mason. Uh, because in graduate school, you don't get taught to solve problems. You get to, you, you're supposed to manage a topic. Right. Uh, not that there isn't, you know, some intellectual question in it, but um, so I was in a hearing and if I remember correctly, it was the day that Reagan was shot. The subject was the environmental impact of multilateral development loans. The, you know, the banks being bad guys. And um, in a minute, I will remember the name of the Brazilian who testified. He later was actually Minister of the Environment during 1992. Um, had come out of the chemical industry, you know, with insecticides and all of that stuff and saw the truth. Right? Um, anyway, he started going off about the impact of these loans on social systems. And, and I went away from it thinking that these loans are actually doing things that are not intended by the loans that they were leading to a debt crisis in South America where part of the response was cutting national budgets of things like park protection, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't what the individual projects were doing, which was the subject of the, of the hearing, uh, but the indirect effects. And so I thought about it and then uh, well, I wonder if you could turn that around somehow. And I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. You know, you never get to choose your own headline. And I've had, I've had actually a headline which was the opposite of what I was saying in the article. But this one was perfect. It was called Save Debtor Nations Apostrophe Ecology. And that's where my scholarly instinct to publish, right, uh, really paid off. You know, in the, in the actual article, I, I didn't have this precise mechanism that ended up uh, at the time, but everybody acknowledged that that's where it came from. And we're probably about to get a great new wave of these kinds of things, because the amount of indebtedness in the world is enormous. So that's how it happened. And then, uh, you know, it sort of took off. So billions of dollars of it were done the last time anybody counted, which was about 20 years ago. Uh, but it still goes on. Uh, it just doesn't make headlines mm -hmm. uh, the way some disaster does, right? And it basically, I think, also encouraged an even larger field of innovative conservation finance. So that one was all built around debt to actual commercial banks like Citicorp and stuff. Uh, most of the debt subsequently has been government to government debt. And I anticipate that is probably what a lot of the next generation will be also. Uh, but rather, rather than sit there and, and, you know, have a difficult balance sheet, if there's a way you can reduce your indebtedness by converting it to something in local currency uh, that you would want to do anyway, well, why not?
right? Seems like you have a, a practicality about your, your thinking when it comes to these kinds of things. One of the big questions that we try to ask everyone is, is about hope and uh, optimism. And we like to think of uh, uh, Michael Soule's quote where he's neither uh, optimistic or pessimistic, he's possibilistic. We've kind of built our entire organization off of that. <laughs> My question to you is, and you kind of already mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but where is it that you find the hope and the, uh, the inspiration to, to keep going? Because you could have retired 30 years ago and, and had twice the career that most people have. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer that. <laughs> um, probably just the way I'm built. You know, and I do look at every day as, in a way, as starting from a clean slate. And that if something hasn't just literally gone extinct, well, then there's something you can do about it. Right? So, so this course I give is called Challenges in Biodiversity. The students are a little confused the first class or two, but then they really get it because it's about learning how to solve problems. And in the very first lecture, I say, I have a, I have a simple-minded view of the world, that there are two kinds of people. And one kind will encounter a problem and stop dead. And the other kind will encounter the same problem and figure a way around it. And I said, at the end of this course, I want you to be the latter. And I would hope with newer generations of scientists that that attitude is, is spreading. This might be the hardest question, but uh, do you have a favorite animal? You know, I've been asked that a couple times and I never give the same answer. <laughs> uh, wow, that's so hard. So, you know, yeah, birds are generally my favorite group, but I can get excited by, you know, really weirdo things. Right? And um, the largest, most powerful raptor on the planet is the harpy eagle. Lives in the canopy. Uh, its wings are shortish to give it good maneuverability. Uh, lives on monkeys, which it attacks by swooping down on them and balling up its claws into a big fish and punching them out. <laughs> and then they fall to the rainforest floor and they go down and nail it with a talon string. Or, or they feed on sloths. And sloths hang on to the branch for dear life. And so they just take the branch with the sloth, right? They are awesome animals, let's put it that way. Well, it turns out that we have a harpy eagle nest, literally 200 meters from Camp 41. Probably been there the entire time we've had Camp 41 because they're very, very quiet. And it wasn't on a, uh, you know, a main trail. And, and one of our marvelous sort of local staff who are sort of self-trained woods people, are really, they're so good, mm -hmm. was in camp one day and he heard what he recognized as the sound of basically a baby harpy eagle. So they went exploring. They eventually found out where this nest was. And it was, you know, in this tree that goes up, you know, 30 meters above the canopy. And I mean, just amazing. And we've had at least two full nesting cycles there. We keep waiting for it to start again. I'm hopeful that it will happen. <laughs> but it's just amazing, you know. And you can sort of almost coexist with harpy eagles, you know, and not even know it. Well, who can't get excited about things like that, right? You're definitely pulling at the heartstrings for me because we grew up birding with our, our dad. He's a big birder, and that's kind of what we got in, how we got into this. And for me, it was always the raptors. Like, as you kind of mentioned, they're, they're big, they're, they're scary. They kill and eat things with their face, which is just, as an inner seven-year-old, I love that. <laughs> And when we went to the Amazon two summers ago, that was my only thing I wanted to see was a harpy eagle. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it, but I did get to see uh, some, some other really amazing things. Um, well, if the nest comes back, you guys could, should come to Camp 41. 
Oh, yeah. As soon as we're allowed to travel, that'll be the first place we go. <laughs> yeah, I can't resist telling you a final story. Back in 1989, there was a Hollywood NGO called ECHO, Earth Communications Office. And it was sort of the magnet for, for those in in the industry interested in environment. The head of it, who's been lost to cancer, her, na- her name was Bonnie Reese, but she, she found me on an airplane on the 4th of July going into Aspen right? uh, and realized it was me and said they wanted to do a trip to the Amazon. So there was, there was a Hollywood trip. It included John Ritter, you know, of Two Threes Company or whatever it is, uh, delightful guy. And boy, did he get it. He totally got it because years later he said to me, I remember when we went into the fragment that there was no moss. That's, that's how he understood how it had gotten dry and hot. And, you know, there was no moss, right? But also in that group was Tom Cruise. And he was basically, you know, a little more than a kid then, but anyway. And we got along really well. There was no Scientology, none of that stuff, right? <laughs> um, so I think he actually had a really good time. I had the the hammock sort of set up. So that time, his first wife, Mimi Rogers, was in the outside hammock. And then there was Tom, and then there was me, right? It's half light uh, the next morning. Tom had fallen into the habit of calling me Indy, like an Indiana Jones, right? So he says, he says, hey, Indy, what time is it? I said, it's 5.30. He said, how do you know? He said, the Mot Mot just called. <laughs> it blew his mind. <laughs> and you, you know, I mean, they, they are crepuscular, right? You can set your watch by it almost. <laughs> Udu, Udu. Anyway, guys, I would love to take you to Camp 41. You, you're terrific. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to Dr. Thomas Lovejoy for being so generous with his time. And also special thanks to Kat Coots and Carmen Thorndike for helping us put this together. Music for this episode was provided by A Picture Book. Producer on this episode was Taylor Parker. Now, please head over to pelicanus.org for more episodes of this podcast and others. And please remember to like and subscribe before you go. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time.